There is a lull in conversation, so perhaps I will take advantage of that. Um, so it's always an honor to get to introduce our speaker, but it's a particular delight today to be able to introduce Professor Sylvia Lindner from the School of Information at the University of Michigan. Um, Sylvia's research, as you will hear, crosses many areas of interest to us in informatics, including HCI, CSCW, Science and Technology Studies, and also East Asian Studies. And her first book, Prototype Nation, won, has won so many awards that I'm not even going to sit and try to list them because, because after all, we want to leave her time to speak. Um, but has been very influential in her in studies of innovation culture and technology production, particularly in China, but also what we can learn about other sites through that. Um, today, however, I think our talk, the talk is gonna come not from that book, but from a future book. The really important thing for me to say though, is of course that the dissertation research that Sylvia did that led to Prototype Nation was conducted right here in informatics. So she is one of our own alumni purely by chance having all of our last week and then Sylvia here. Um, you know, those of you who are here and in, in our PhD program currently like, you know, um, toiling in the salt mines of the PhD program can look <laughs> at Sylvia as living proof that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So Sylvia, I'll hand it over to you by saying, welcome home. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, so much. Well, it is indeed such an extreme um, pleasure to be with you all today because of all these many memories of being here as a grad student and also for part of my postdoctoral time um, working with with Paul and many of you here. And so it's yeah, it's it's extra special to be back here on campus. And um, I'll be talking today about something that is China related for sure. Um, also a little bit related to the book that Paul just mentioned, um, but it takes us into a sort of slightly different direction, um, focusing on this theme, what I currently call data engines. And I'll unpack a little bit what I mean by data engines and why engines in, in a second. Um, but um, yeah, I was, I was here 12 years ago the last time which is kind of incredible <laughs> and sort of similar in sort of Paul, what Paul just mentioned, um, I wanted to just say for the students in the room, you know, um, this is, you know, a place uh, that has such high standards, you know, it took me like to publish a book, for the book to win an award, for 12 years later to be invited out here again. <laughs> So for the student in the room, rest assured, um, UC Irvine has its high standards that, um, you know, shape our lives in future in many ways. Um, so anyway, so this is the book that uh, Paul mentioned um, and that in many ways was, you know, started out here um, when I was a PhD student here, the ethnographic research for this began, um, what is now over 12, 14 years ago. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about some of the findings and how they influence my current uh, thinking as well. And I'm happy to also talk in the Q&A. Um, people want to hear about book writing and ethnographic research in, in China. Um, I also wanted to, to plug um, a research center that um, I started in Michigan a couple of years ago. Um, we are currently, um, this is, we're in like our third year now, depending on how you count, because we kind of started during the pandemic which is an odd time to start a research center. Um, but um, the center is called the Center for Ethics, Society, and Computing, which spells escape, which was inspired um, by the escape key on the keyboard, which got introduced to the keyboard, of course, uh, to allow an operator to say no when a process was spiraling out of control. And in that same spirit, our center is very much so committed to activist forms of interventions when technology reproduces unwanted results and especially, you know, produces various forms of violence as an injustice. And so on that broader topic, we have a theme here, this, this uh, 2003 and 2004 year on residues. Um, so this is sort of, you know, comes out of, an, of, of the notion that, you know, we are currently living 
in a moment that is often sort of theorized as the age of AI or data and the sort of we are told these sort of stories that data reaches everywhere. There's seemingly no escape. Everything sort of, you know, is, is sort of um, shaped by sort of that current vision of, of data commodification. And so we, we sort of are taking that theme literally and thinking about, okay, in that sort of claim to, to nothing is left behind or sort of everything reaches um, through data, what, what might be sort of, um, you know, left in these traces though of data accumulation. So things that, you know, data that's not used or life that isn't attractive to computation. Um, tricky histories of other kinds of technological and political moments that we might sort of not be thinking about. So that's our current theme. So if people want to talk more about the theme or work with us at Escape, um, you know, with regards to the theme, I would be very happy to have a conversation about that. Okay, so data engines. I promise to talk about data engines. Um, so I want to start by just saying what I mean by data engines. I position data engines as an analytical intervention in the how into sort of modes of how we have come to think about the relationship between AI systems, data, and governance. So I approach this from an ethnographic sensibility, specifically a multi-sided sensibility, um, where I think about the ways in which AI produces and reproduces various forms of violences in a particular in a particular sort of political moment in the United States and how that is and cannot be separated from other pasts and other um, projects of extractions um, in regions elsewhere. So let me just start out by something very concrete. What do I mean by this shifting geopolitical landscape of AI and sort of the moment of data governance we're in by starting with something that is close to my research, which is sort of the ongoing debate between China and the US of how we should think about AI. So AI and data-driven technologies are framed often in very sort of, in, in sort of recently where these stories of national security, there's news articles on the so-called new Cold War between China and the US and AI arms race. And in the US media discourse broadly, China is often also presented across these various stories and tropes as a kind of threatening other. So China is portrayed as the perfected surveillance state, as the invisible cage, the perfected police state. And so with this notion of data engines, I really hope to intervene in this particular sort of often sensationalized story um, of China that rely on the totalitarian surveillance state as an explanatory frame. So these stories often take it as a given um, that China already is a successful top-down, full encompassing police state um, that is centrally enabled by data and AI. And these writings, in that sense, often also advance the idea that China can and should be understood predominantly as an automated top-down system of control. And that's often positioned then in, contra in sort of distinction from a Western liberal kind of democracy framework, um, assuming that the West and the US in particular hold kind of an exceptional status in comparison to China sort of framed as a dangerous other. So with data engines, I want to I want to intervene in this in this particular trope and story of the surveillance state that takes China as sort of the the sort of um, uh, orientalist other and dangerous other. So why data engines and why specifically this notion of the engine? So let's look a little bit about um, how the Oxford English Dictionary, for instance, defines engine. So an engine is, for instance, understood as a mechanism that serves as an energy source or as something used to affect a purpose, an agent, an instrument. And so I want to draw your attention here specifically to this notion of an instrument and this notion of a mechanism that serves as an energy source. So we'll be playing with this throughout the talk. So um, data engines then with this, I hope to shift our attention towards the bodies, the energies and the affect that's necessary to produce a governance that is mediated and enacted through data systems. So many frameworks of data and AI currently and how we think about it, um, talk a lot about um, political control. They talk about um, algorithmic effects 
but there's very little attention towards the affective dimensions that the affective instruments that actually make data systems work. So what makes them enticing? What, how do data systems actually enroll people in being on board with them? So I wanna draw specific attention here to the affective role of, of data instruments. And throughout this, um, I really draw from a feminist and critical race um, sensibility. So this will weave throughout the talk today. But I want to start out with this quote by Kalindi Wara from her 2015 book on life support. Um, and this is a quote uh, from page nine, where she says, the techniques of extracting vital energy from the lives of workers is an accumulation strategy, which depends on structures of racialized and gendered difference. OK, I'll come back to this point later. But um, uh, what is very important for me here to, to highlight is the sort of notion of extraction of energy through, through, um, through technological means. Um, so feminist technoscience broadly has um, centered affective dimensions of labor and techniques of the governance. And Kalini Wara's work here in particular um, explored this in the context of surrogacy and outsourced IT labor. And I argue that the kinds of extractive um, practices that Kalindi Wara observed in, in sort of outsourced IT history is something that we now see um, spread as a much more broader form of violence um, um, across various forms of population management. So it's not anymore just limited to an IT context, but it's really sort of extrapolated out to population management more broadly. And this is a form of violence that we seldom see when we focus on surveillance. So this is a form of violence that operates through the production of feelings through affect. And so I've been somewhat theoretical so far. So I want to ground this in um, ethnographic research that I've conducted over the last um, two to three years. I'll draw specifically um, from three different sites that I was um, embedded in um, during my sabbatical um, in China in 2021 and 2022. Um, I was able to observe um, the Communist Party state's turn towards data-driven governance during its zero COVID management. So while it was managing populations during the spread of COVID. I also did work um, in precision farming. So these are large scale agricultural experiments at the outskirts of China's big cities. And then third, I will draw uh, from a field work that I did in rural parts of China. And this is often sort of now theorized as China's so-called inwards turn. Um, young people uh, turning away from China's big cities and moving to the countryside. So I spent several months living with different um, youth communities in rural China. And so this will be the last sort of data point I will be drawing from today to, to weave this all together and to come back to my data engines analytical concept. But um, I want to start out by uh, drawing out two stories from this ethnographic research. Um, one is the story of my colleague Yuling Sun, who is a computer science professor at a university in Shanghai. And the other story is um, uh, of a young woman um, who returned to China's countryside at the onset of the pandemic. So I want to start with Yuling's story. So during the 2022 Shanghai lockdown, um, so this was a time uh, when COVID spread more rapidly in China, despite its zero COVID policy. Um, this was mostly due to the new Omicron variants at that time. The city of Shanghai went into a complete full on lockdown where people uh, were required to stay indoors um, for what ended up being two to three months for many people. So during the early phase of the Shanghai lockdown, Yuling became a pandemic volunteer worker at her university campus. Uh, during this time, she and I stayed in close contact as she was going through, which ended up being a four months long period for her where she basically lived on campus full time. Uh, so let me give you just a brief backdrop here, because not everyone might be familiar in, with regards to what China's specific COVID management uh, situation was like over the last three years. It's, it was um, you know, something that was managed quite differently from how we are familiar with sort of COVID management here in the United States. So 
briefly, very briefly after the initial outbreak in Wuhan, the Chinese Communist Party had implemented what it called the zero COVID strategy. So I've already mentioned this a little bit. The zero COVID strategy was the stated commitment to quote unquote, eliminate the virus and preventing a public health crisis at all costs. So the party state at that time basically positioned um, its pre-existing bureaucratic mechanisms, but specifically data-driven technology as a key approach to manage COVID and as a key guarantee for public safety and to keep COVID literally at a, at a level close to zero. So in other words, the political work of managing COVID was delegated to data-driven tools. So this is how STS scholars, you know, what they would typically describe as a form of technopolitics. So political responsibility delegated to particular kind of technological tools. Um, so the adoption of these data-driven processes to manage COVID was implemented in practice via a two-pronged system the implementation of a health QR code system that tracked people's whereabouts and close contacts. And you can see a screenshot here of, of the COVID tracking app that was widely used in China um, on the bottom here, but also the reliance on a large workforce of volunteer workers and low level bureaucrats who operated on the local neighborhood level. So people who would actually implement um, the data tracking system would follow up with local communities, uh, would perform COVID tests, would make sure the data is actually fed into right, the right databases and so on. So it was presented as a sort of fully automated data-driven system, but it required massive amounts of volunteer labor. So for about two systems, uh, for about two years, the system worked really, really well. So I arrived in China in fall 2021, and after about three weeks in um, a, um, a quarantine facility, I basically could live a completely normal life. And this was at a time when there were still sort of heavy self-imposed COVID restrictions here in the US where people were currently mostly self-managing sort of the, the spread of COVID. Um, so for two years, this worked really well. This was when many other regions reported, you know, increasingly high rates um, of COVID related death in 2020 and 21. Um, and China had really moved within a very short time span of only a couple of months down to zero COVID-related death. Um, so this all began to change um, in 2022 when the new Omicron variant spread in late March that year. And so following several weeks of at first partial lockdowns, cities, big cities like Shanghai um, moved into sort of citywide lockdowns. And this, um, particular lockdown in Shanghai lasted for about two to three months, um, but it depended on the district you were in. Um, so you, my friend Yuling's university campus too had gone into a lockdown shortly after the official announcement. And many of the other faculty and instructors um, like Yuling basically stepped up as these so-called volunteer workers at that time. So the residents at that, both the students and the residents were allowed um, you know, to roam freely within their compounds, um, but mostly just to take PCR tests and otherwise they were confined to their either rooms or apartments. And very few businesses could operate at the time and people often also ended up struggling to obtain basic necessities like medical supplies, elderly support and food. So it was really up to citizens like my friend Yuling, um, so-called frontline volunteer workers who were kind of tasked with um, retaining like immediate safety on campus, performing daily um, uh, PCR tests, providing food for students in Yuling's case, but also managing the emotional turmoil um, that spread both on campus and really in the city as a whole, as people were locked in often very small and confined spaces for, for many, many weeks. So frustrated with the amount of manual labor that was demanded of her, Yuling together with a colleague in her computer science department implemented a localized data management system that would eventually be adopted actually across the whole campus. So it was kind of a prototype that really helped sort of the management of COVID on the campus as a whole. The, the system was technologically actually quite simple. Um, but it was crucial in producing these kinds of feelings of stability and order at a time that was really sort of perceived as, as sort of, you know, both personally stressful, but really also a moment of social upheaval. 
um, with many citizens increasingly expressing anger, frustration, um, both online and, and sort of through media outlets. And this, this sort of first expression of frustration and anger was, was, was in quite public form at that time. So this data tool that Yuling um, built with her colleagues, um, she described it in her field notes um, as really not being so much about the advancement of a data science tool, but about providing warmth and care. So this was in turn, you know, really about cultivating this kind of attitude that something that was drawn from a discipline of computer science, kind of solving complex societal problems with technological intervention, interventions could actually um, make a difference for social stability. So kind of this notion that the tools that data scientists offer can also enable the cultivation um, of stability and the feeling that broken systems can and indeed should be fixed by citizens themselves. So these are some screenshots from the kind of um, emotional work that the volunteer workers on campus, including Yuling, did. So both the data work and the other day-to-day -day tasks um, centered um, on campus, centered around the production of positive feelings, not only about the campus's management of the lockdown, but also about the government's overall management um, of the city and COVID at that time. So this was really a crucial form of emotional labor that produced good feelings, right? Um, about government policies that were actually that time sharply criticized by, by Chinese citizens. And this was, was a moment you know, where many people feared both social and political instability, especially sort of in, in the bureaucracy. Um, so the kind of work that was performed, it was really sort of not just about taking care of the students, but also producing sort of positive feelings about, about COVID management that was increasingly falling apart at that time. Um, so China's driven, driven COVID management, this is really what I wanna draw your attention to here, required in that sense, energy, it required active participation, and it required the ongoing production of feelings. Um, I've written about this together with Yu Ling um, and uh, one of my students, Yu Chen Chen, in a, in a recent Kai publication that centers on Yu Ling, on Yu Ling's autoethnographic accounts on campus, um, where we zoom in particular about the circumscribed agency, as we call it in the paper, that was granted to select citizens. So citizens who had a capacity to intervene through their data science and engineering backgrounds in this moment of technological breakdown. Um, in this moment where technology kind of became a tool to manage broader feelings, not just on campus, um, but really in society writ large. So the citizens produced positive feelings, even of happiness, of support, of care, and of security through a combination of both this form of emotional labor, of what I call happiness labor, and data work. So when I talk about happiness labor, it might sound a little bit confusing because people are, might, might say, well, people weren't really happy during COVID and the lockdowns and the pandemic. So what do I mean by happiness labor? So I draw here specifically on the work by the feminist and critical race scholar, Sarah Ahmed, who has um, defined sort of and written much about the promise of happiness. And, and here she defines it as follows in this quote where she says, the promise of happiness is an instrument of neoliberal governance that charges individuals with the responsibility to be happy for others. Happiness is a redescription of life as a project. It has a promising nature, suggesting that happiness lies ahead of us, at least if we do the right thing, attach ourselves to the right objects, the right dreams, and the right people. And so I've been using this notion of happiness labor also in my book, Prototype Nation, where I describe it as the kind of um, labor um, that the tech industry has increasingly relied upon to produce good feelings about technology, despite the increasing realization um, that technology often serves the interests um, of, of markets, um, of those who invest, um, and despite the increasing realization that technology might also be furthering various forms of, of control and, and racialized forms of violence. So happiness is the kind of labor that in, goes into producing good feelings about a technology in this very moment of, of distrust in, in the very promise of, of technology itself. Um, so 
I saw this happiness labor that I wrote about in the book that was really based on earlier research in China in the sort of incubator type spaces and manufacturing spaces um, from six years earlier. I saw it sort of resurface in this moment of technological breakdown during zero COVID management in China, where it became so crucial um, to promote the data-driven systems that were kind of partially falling apart uh, during the breakdown of zero COVID um, and to refashion them as, as something that could still guarantee long-term stability and even care for citizens. Okay, so I wanna now turn to a different site that I promised to talk about earlier. So this, um, might on first glance seem worlds away from the kind of data-driven governance of Shanghai's zero COVID management system and how it uh, broke down um, in 2022. Um, in in um, early 2022, and then later when I escaped the Shanghai lockdown, I'll talk about my escape from the Shanghai lockdown later, I spent much time in rural parts of China. And during my time there, I met um, a young woman uh, 26 year old Yuan, um, who had recently moved um, to rural Guangdong. Guangdong is, an, is a province in the southeast of China known for its industrial production. Um, she had uh, moved back to China at the onset of the pandemic um, in 2019 after obtaining a college degree in religion in the United States. And then she worked in Shanghai for a while. And so she talked with me quite a bit about um, what is in Chinese referred to as Neichuan, which is a, a sort of a literally translates into something like involution, but is, is sort of a broader vernacular right now in China to refer to extreme overwork and exhaustion that young people experience and many other people experience um, in the big Chinese cities, but especially young people. It's become a vernacular for young people um, like Xuan, who leave the big cities to live a different life elsewhere, where they feel like they can escape that kind of that kind of overwork and exhaustion. So Xuan decides to take a chance and leave Shanghai. She's frustrated with nature and this overwork, and moves to a small 20 people village in the southeastern province of Guangdong. So this is about the the village itself is small, but it's only about three hours drive from the city of Chuhai. Um, so it's not completely removed from the city. Um, it's, it's still in proximity, but it feels quite rural. When you get there, you feel like you're in a very different place. So I first met Xuan in December 2021 at a local farmer's market that she organized. It was her brainchild, and she had persisted with the event, despite local government intervention at the last minute, who saw the... The, the event as a major risk of the spread of COVID. So it almost, the farmer's market was almost shut down, but, but Xuan made it happen anyway. So that's how I first met her. And then I spent a, a couple of weeks with the, the people who surrounded Xuan and who had been in this village for about two years. So just five minutes from the farmer's market is this little coffee shop here that was built and maintained um, by the 26 year old Rana. Um, so as you can see here, the coffee shop also doubles as her personal living space. Uh, Rana moved to this particular village a year earlier than Xuan. But like Xuan, she, she's fluid, transitioning between urban and rural contexts. She studied abroad. She switches fluently between Chinese and English. And she tells me all that in sort of this mixed language sort of setting as she brews me a coffee with beans that are grown in the southwestern province of Yunnan. Did the tone suddenly something, something change? <laughs> <laughs> Did I become louder? Or yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. okay. Um, so you can see her brew the coffee for me um, with, with sort of um, that she obtained from a group of young people who have their own coffee plantation in the southwestern province of Yunnan, which I will talk a little bit about later. So the old villagers that I also met at that time, many of whom have never actually left this particular village, refer to these recent arrivals as so-called new villagers, with which they kind of echo the official state discourse um, on, on how uh, they describe young people moving to the countryside. And these so-called new villagers, you could think of them as sort of experimenting with but also making money off what they call alternative ways of living, alternative ways of um, food production, but also spiritual practices. Um, 
that sort of has a sort of whimsical aesthetic, as you can see here in some of these spaces in the village that, uh, that they set up right next to the pre-existing farms. But it's also a particular kind of aesthetic that sells really well. So Suan told me repeatedly that there is a business model here. Um, as she sort of waved, and you can see the buildings in the near distance, just behind the village, um, are new um, apartment complexes that mostly attract people from Hong Kong and from Shenzhen who want to get out of the big cities and have sort of a secondary home in the countryside. And these are exactly the kind of people that Xuan and her peers attract also to the farmer's market. And so the idea is that they connect um, people in the village, people who have been doing farming practices uh, their whole lives with the sort of new urban class that can uh, invest in new modes of sustainability and eco-farming and so on. So this village, where I spent quite a bit of time, is in many ways, as I would learn later, as I traveled to many other similar places all over China, a manifestation of what many have come to refer to as China's inwards turn, what I mentioned earlier. So this is a younger generation of temporary visitors that are is attracted to these rural sites, almost as a temporary form of escape of the drudgery of work and life in the big cities. These visitors, unlike Xuan and her friends, were there full time, often just come for a couple of days or for a week at a time. Um, and they, so you can see some of these more stylized images that I posted here. This is the kind of backdrop that many people would use in their social media profiles. And many of them would also come to these rural sites to make money. So the rule is almost like a backdrop, a particular form of aesthetic that sells on social media platforms like the Chinese platform Xiaohongshu. Um, so kind of influencer marketing, social media posts, people going to these rural sites um, to kind of engage with the countryside to reposition themselves online. But it is really through these transregional networks of localized experiments that various new villages circulate through various rural sites in China. And this is mostly in the name of redefining what, what life should look like, what life itself is, and what it means to be Chinese in China today, especially in this moment of nature that I mentioned earlier, where many young people are, are really fed up with their life in the big city. So this is in part the draw. The draw is a different form of life here that promises an escape from the big city. So when I meet the lo when I met the local government official in charge of the village, he shows me the party slogans of rural revitalization that he had um, let print on the walls of the village's houses just a month before my arrival. And um, he tells me what the new villages are doing is really a good thing, both for this new government policy on rural revitalization that I will explain in a second, um, but also for his particular village. They spread, he told me, Liang, which is a Chinese phrase uh, that would translate into something like positive feelings or positive energy. Um, so he's saying that these young people coming here spread good vibes about the, about the village, right? The village becomes something that other people want to see, that other people want to come to. So let me just briefly back up and talk about rural revitalization because it's a very significant, significant government policy that uh, went into effect in 2017 when President Xi Jinping declares rural re revitalization and national strategy. Uh, this is significant because it's a move away from a decade long mm -hmm. um, earlier policy that was called poverty alleviation, which meant basically building roads, building basic infrastructures, especially in rural parts of China, connecting the rural with the urban, um, funneling resources into local villages for education, basically funneling money into an infrastructure, into these local settings. Rural revitalization is a, a sharp departure from that. It's basically the idea to build on these pre-existing infrastructures um, that the government has been building um, and to ask of people to be entrepreneurial, to now come to the countryside and revitalize it on their own. So rather than a concrete government investment, individual citizens are asked to implement rural revitalization on their own. And then in 2021, um, at the height of the global pandemic, new regulations were released that frame data-driven transformations in particular as the key toolkit for China's new uh, rural revitalization project. So it's the idea that not only should 
young people who feel entrepreneurial go to China's countryside, but they should also deploy data-driven tools to help revitalize the countryside. So this is the 2021 policy um, that, that came out um, five years later. So um, the work that these so-called new villages then perform, which is often very self-driven with, with much idealism and passion, could be seen as a form of happiness labor that produces good feelings about this reframing of the countryside that was long portrayed as backwards. So this is really important to understand that young people in China did not want to go back to the countryside. Um, they wanted to go to Shanghai, to Beijing, to New York, to London, to Berlin, um, the cool places where, you know, where creative work was happening. And the countryside was long understood as a place that was kind of backwards. Um, so this is a drastic shift in how the countryside is framed, both by young people and by the government. Um, and uh, what I want to draw your attention to is just how the word happiness happens to feature across various sites of this village, as you can see depicted here in the photos. And so the young people I met really produced a form of happiness labor in that sense that they repitched and repositioned this village in, in sort of a very positive sense. Um, and by extension, then also, even though they deliberately, you know, meant to do that, also um, kind of created um, a support structure for the government's own larger project of rural revitalization. So in other words, they performed the crucial affective groundwork of framing China's countryside of worthy of investment, um, of worthy of upgrading via the, you know, both data-driven investments in agriculture um, and data-driven experiments more broadly. And so I just wanted to end with, with this particular image here for this section of the talk, because this is a photo I took at a big farm experiment that's uh, just at the outskirts of Shanghai. So this is basically a farm that operates like a factory which um, with data centers um, in Israel and in Eastern Europe, um, alongside data centers in China. So it's a very transnational international project. But this is the kind of automated future that the government hopes young people might also be moving towards in China's countryside. Um, but it's a big, it's a big leap to from very rural parts of China to building these kinds of big farming experiments there. Um, so, but that's what the government is hoping for when it encourages young people to change the affective relationship that people have with China's countryside, sort of a priming of what is yet to come. So this is what the government would like to see in these rural parts of China. Um, okay, so I want to offer now some concluding thoughts about what I was just talking about to tie together my earlier sort of more theoretical um, offerings about what I mean by data engines. I will tie that together to Yuling and Xuan's experiences that I was just describing. And then I want to end with sort of this sort of a brief uh, discussion of what we might think resistance looks like, or what is, is are these young people, what they're doing is this simply a form of co-option by, by the state, or, or, is it, or is it something else? So I began this talk by arguing that the analytical lens of data engines draws our attention to affective instruments the energy, the form of emotional labor, or what I theorize through this notion of happiness labor that goes into stabilizing data governance as something that is desirable, as something that is a good thing. So I've talked about Xuan's attempts to extract herself from this pervasive sense of nature and of overwork and exhaustion in China's big cities. And in her search for these alternative ways of living, she and the intergenerational group of people I met in this village in Guangdong, um, you know, sort of turned what was largely framed as a place that's uninhabitable or that's backwards um, into a space of experimental play, a place that's seemingly outside the reach of the state, where people tinker not only with rural farming experiments and sustainability, but also with spiritual practices. And I didn't talk so much about the spiritual practices today, but I can talk about it in the discussion later. There were many eating readings in that village that I was participating in, if that says anything, if that's familiar to people. So basically what they have built in the process, we might think of that as something like an affective prototype for rural revitalization, so for the government's project that is meant to arrive in the villages at a later point. 
So the citizens' initiatives then um, in the countryside sit alongside um, citizen-led experiments um, that we could see during the COVID management and during the Shanghai lockdown and Yuling's example and experiences that I was describing earlier. Um, so they frame on the one hand the countryside, but they also frame data-driven population management as something that feels good, as something that is livable, as something that is even desirable. Uh, let me see, my cursor just went away. Here we go. So in other words, in both cases, we can, we can see how these citizen-led initiatives, even unintentionally so, provided the affective infrastructural backdrop for two key government projects. So the data-driven farming and rural revitalization project on the one hand, and the data-driven population management that has been accelerated um, during the zero COVID management and that still um, exists in China today after, after the pandemic as well. So I draw here by sort of my attention to affect, I, I draw particularly from the feminist um, China scholar Chia Yang's work, who has documented vividly how Chinese governance processes increasingly rely on the production of positive feelings. So she says, the pursuit of happiness becomes a moral imperative for the quality citizen. And this is from her 2014 publication on this topic. So in other words, uh, the Chinese Communist Party state, who is often more commonly associated with these top-down um, mechanisms of authoritarian control. Remember, I had on my earlier slide the surveillance state rhetoric of, of how you know, AI is often sort of discussed in a sort of Chinese governance context. So quite in contrast to this dominant image, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, governs at least select groups of its citizens. So for instance, the young data scientists who helped manage COVID during the Shanghai lockdown, the young people who take it upon themselves to move to China's countryside. Um, it governs these kinds of people with a certain um, uh, degree of freedom. They're even allowed to um, engage in political, um, in political practice. So it, it sort of manages them also in that sense via the production of feelings. Um, via the sort of promise of that the countryside is something worthy of investment or the data-driven management system of a city like Shanghai is something that is worthy expanding outwards. Um, so I've shown in this talk today, for instance, how the circumscribed agency that people like Yuling and her data science colleagues um, were able to take on is assigned to those who produce good feelings about the state. So it's not granted to everyone. It's, it's granted to people who fashion themselves um, as capable to intervene technologically, for instance, or as those um, who take it upon themselves to move to China's countryside. Um, so I want to come back to this notion of data engines then, and what I want to do with this, and this is um, still very experimental for me. I'm working on a, on a book project right now, so I would love your, your feedback on this, or if you think the data engines concept works. Um, I'm not, I'm not fully committed to this project, to this particular term, but it's something that, that I'm sort of playing with at the moment. So I think of it as an, an, an analytical frame that helps me think about this relationship between a turn towards AI and data-driven systems and governance that does not begin with the a priori framework of surveillance or does not begin with the a, a priori sort of notion of top-down control, but turns our attention to the affective instruments that are necessary to sustain both the allure, sort of the promise of automation, but also the fears of their potential side effects. So I've attempted to show today, for instance, how data-driven governance requires active maintenance. It requires personal investment. It requires emotional investment and affective labor. And um, it, 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 it's based on a kind of active form of participation. So this is quite in contrast, again, to this notion of a top-down machinic system that acts upon people. So for the last couple of minutes I have, I want to now turn towards how we might think about resistance in this affective regime of control that does not look like coercion, that does not look like top-down control, but more keen to something like for those of us in the world of HCI, user or citizen participation. So what does resistance look like in a 
in a in an affective regime of control that invites our participation. What is what does resistance look like there? And is it even does it even make sense if we are active participants in the governance forms that we produce? So some of you might have seen this. Maybe can I get a showing of hands of who has seen this inter internet meme before? Okay, a couple of people have seen it before. So this is an inter meme that circulated widely last year with a cat embodying three popular Chinese phrases that have come to function as a shorthand for complex social and economic transformations in China. So on the top is uh, what is invoked here is the term Neijuan, which I talked about, this term that stands for overwork and exhaustion in the big cities, which was the year of 2020. Um, the year 2021 has come to be associated with this notion of Tangping, often uh, framed as kind of a form of resistance to nature and a form of resistance to overwork. So tumping, as the cat literally shows here, just kind of doing nothing, laying flat, laying down. So a form of resistance that's basically by doing nothing at all as a way of extracting yourself from exhaustion and overwork. And then finally, in 2022, the, the vernacular that sort of circulated in, in sort of Chinese social media was this term of run xue or runology, sort of a study of how to escape. So xue is the word for study in Chinese. So it's people were talking about how to leave and escape China altogether. Um, and this is especially sort of in response to a worsening sort of economic condition in China that a lot of people are talking about these days. And again, it's often associated with young people who make that sort of move as the economy quote unquote falters. So the week before the Shanghai lockdown, I too ran. The people familiar in the room with anthropologist Clifford Geertz's work will know that this was not the first time an ethnographer literally ran. And this is the place I ran to. So after a few weeks of being in another quarantine, I traveled through the mountains of the southwestern province of Yunnan. Um, I ended up living on a farm for several months in a small village just outside the city of Dali. Dali was often described to me as kind of a prototype of the places like the village where Xuan had done her work. So Dali is kind of an archetype, a place where hippies had already moved to 10, 15 years earlier. Um, it is part of the region that anthropologist James C. Scott has famously described as Zomia in his work on the art of not being governed. So the zone of highland Southeast Asia, a site of resistance and escape, as Scott theorized it from the Burmese states, the Tibetan states, the Han state. Um, and so part of my time there I spent with the people who had run, who had run from China's big cities. And some of these people were very active in crypto and Web3 technology. They had transplanted some of their co-working communities from Beijing and Shanghai to Dali. Um, where they kind of coexisted with ideas on feminist resistance, mushroom growing, as well as other more psychedelic variants. Mm -hmm. And these mostly young people in their 20s and 30s uh, were also into winemaking, um, coffee plantations, they ran kitchens out of old farmhouses. And they also hosted a big event while I was there called Vamotopia, which took inspiration from Burning Man. It's a riff of Burning Man, but instead of burning a large wooden figure, they burned a cat. And this is the cat is basically an, a, a sort of cultural um, artifact from the region um, in China. So I traveled last year, I ran again, I traveled to Thailand in December last year to follow some of the people who had ran this Wamutopia event in Dali. Um, this is what they did in December 2023 in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Um, where many of the people now had moved basically altogether. So they had they, they left China altogether. And this is um, how one of the people who I spent both, I spent time with him in Dali, but I also spent time with him in Thailand. This is how he described it to me. He said, in China, there is a very low ceiling that the government puts up and it keeps lowering it. So one walks around with a bent back, head lowered, hunched over, unable to see clearly and gaze down. So one of the many events that the Vamotopia group organized um, in Chiang Mai was in this very small Chinese language bookstore called Nowhere. And one of the invited panelists there, a queer activist and writer from China, described Run as a search for happiness. So there it was again, 
the word happiness displaced from Shanghai to the village in Guangdong to Dali to Chiang Mai in the Republic of Nowhere in December 2023. And so what I found though in Chiang Mai, and this is where I want to push back against the kind of Jim C. Scott sort of theorizations of escape, wasn't really an escape. These projects didn't exist outside the reach of the state, quite in the same way as Jim C. Scott theorized it. Runology is held together by a fair amount of privilege. These are young people who can actually leave and escape the state. And they're very closely attached to finance investment, crypto um, type venture capital. And they sort of sit alongside various other forms of neoliberal experiments with technology networks. But on the other hand, I also don't want to dismiss them as simply co-opted by the state or by a neoliberal doctrine. Um, I think what we see here, and this is sort of encapsulated by this quote, I'm, I'm Chinese, I'm not China, is an insistence that Chineseness and China can be something else, can be something else as the state defines through its tropes of positivity, happiness, and what happiness means and what the good life means. So Wam Utopia and the small books there in Chiang Mai did not offer a full escape, but a departure from the single truth about what China is that's both propagated by the Chinese state and by what we see in our own Western media coverage on China today. And with this, I would like to end. And thank you all so much for being here and look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you so much for this. This is great and uh, you know characteristically rich. And so I think I'll be thinking about this for a long time. But I wanted to invite you to say a little bit more about something you sort of pointed to a couple of times, um, which is this question: to whom are certain kind of affective states granted? Because as you talk about people moving to the countryside, what I'm thinking of all the time are, for instance, all the reports we've read about people who during the sort of during the pandemic moved to say Joshua Tree. Um, and Yucca Valley and places like that. But those are normally articles filled with resentment. They're filled with resentment by locals about what that did to property prices mm -hmm. and to the fact that they're priced out of like their, 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 their own like you know, favorite watering holes and so forth. And so I'm thinking about the difference between moving to the country and being in the country. Um, and, and this question, because largely you've told us a story about the people who did the moving but not necessarily about other people who are not mm -hmm. quite so mobile and who have been there and are not planning to go back somewhere, who are not that Burning Man crypto type people. And so I'm kind of intrigued by, as to the landscape of the sort of affective states associated with this stuff. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Paul. This is a, a great question. And I like the sort of affective landscapes and maybe the different registers of <laughs> that particular affect too, of like who gets to invest in the countryside like now and who actually had to make a living there for a long time. So I didn't get to talk about this today and I already went over time with what I did talk about. <laughs> but, um, I spent, when I was living in the, in the, on the farm in, in outside of Dali, I spent quite a bit of time with the local minority group, the Baizu, um, who uh, have built the farming communities that still feed the region there. Um, these are mostly older people. It's an older generation. The younger generation has moved sort of away to the bigger cities, um, mostly for migrant type jobs um, and to send remittances back home. And this older generation um, is is sort of in an ambivalent sort of sits in an ambivalent relationship to these young people because on the one hand, they want that young people come. They want that young people you know, invest in these kinds of spaces. Um, but uh, they also like the way their local villages have been reworked over the last year doesn't even, you know, sit sort of in in relationship to what these young people are sort of yearning to find in terms of like an authentic countryside. So what I mean by that is, for instance, in Dali, President Xi Jinping visited in 2015 and 16. And during that time, um, you know, he complained bitterly about how polluted the, the local, uh, the big local lake was. And then the local government was like, oh, we need to fix the lake. It's, you know, it doesn't attract tourists. So we need to fix the lake. And so what they ended up doing is instead of cleaning up the lake, they routed the water from the mountains past the farms, past the villagers into the lake so that the mountain water would clean out the lake. 
and the villagers were like but what about our water that we use for the farms you know and whatever so we need that water and so they they pushed back quite a bit and but they didn't get you know this whole system to be reversed but they, what what they ended up doing is tapping the local pipes so they cut hole in the local pipes and they're getting so i too had to carry the local water from a from a central station in the village to my home um, so this is just an example to say to speak to this absurdity that people who actually have been in this community for a long time right to get both the government intervention that sort of wants to create a tourism industry revitalize the countryside a younger generation who comes in and builds these kinds of spaces that attract more you know other younger people from the from the, from the urban spaces and that sits sort of side by side that sort of infrastructural you know struggle in many ways that this older generation has been interfacing with for a long time and they often sort of they don't interface much so there there is a sharp you know and and that's in part what the government was is trying to change as well but um yeah i think it's it's and this is why i was sort of ending with this question of what is that form of move towards the countryside you know is it feeding is it building what the state wants or is it resisting that well, it, i think neither describes it easily neither resistance nor sort of enabling of the state is, is a good way of thinking about it yes uh, wonderful talk i enjoyed the whole thing um so um so it had me thinking about fred turner's work um, in a lot of ways and um, I was just thinking about comfort culture in historically in America. Uh, we had um, in the 60s uh, groups that were going, you know, into the country and stuff that were both very progressive. That's still kind of like in the Burning Man tradition that mm -hmm. you were pointing to uh, here. But the other half of it was sort of like libertarian push. Um, these are the people, you know, that are the survivalists today that just wanted to get off the grid and still do want to be off the grid. And I feel like in China, we're seeing, at least you've kind of told the story of the sort of progressive side, maybe the more, you know, uh, cozy with capital and neoliberal side of it that, you know, has these progressive impulses, um, sees themselves in China. Is there a, like a more libertarian side to that, more of like um, an anti-government push maybe there that's also common and localized somehow in the country? China. Yeah, no, this is a great question. Thank you, because a lot of a lot of the people who I've met, especially the ones who were in the world of crypto and Web3, read these earlier texts. So um, I was traveling in Thailand um, with Kevin Kelly, who is the founder of Wired magazine and who was participating in the whole Earth catalog. And a lot of the people, the young Chinese people who had also made their way to Thailand, drew from these earlier techno libertarianist ideals right and they were reading all you know they're a big fan of james c scott's work right they're sort of drawn to these kinds of notions of um extracting yourself out of a system right anti-systems thinking or turning towards like a notion of self-governance um so i think these ideas coexist alongside many other kind of uh, theories that they're engaging with and that they're reading so it's one particular maybe captivating sort of ideology that they're turning to but it also is something that they find not very satisfactory because it feels like something that doesn't quite work anymore so a lot of them talked about this that it's it's not quite possible to entertain a kind of liberatory potential in this so the technology doesn't feel liberatory for them in that sense, Does that answer. Yeah, that's it. Okay. I had like Mimi and then we'll Katie. Mimi's question, and then I'm going to encourage people to to, to take questions outside to our uh, session. Uh, thanks, Sonia. That was great. Um, what maybe kind of curiosity in a similar vein uh, when you're at about your concept of data engines and the government side of that. So a lot of what you described to me sounded like. Um, at least from my experience in Japan and the U.S., kind of youth-driven cultural innovation, technology innovation, and you describe it as it has been initiated. And I think something that I haven't quite, I, I'd love to hear you connect the dots more is what is, like, this is maybe a chicken and the egg problem, but it seems like that came first, 
as part of the government, you know, but it doesn't feel like a governance moment to me, mm -hmm. at least from the frames, the cultural frames I, and political frames I bring to it. So like the analog I have in Japan is when, um, you know, there's always been sort of a counterculture art scene around things like anime and manga, very much non, I mean, a big industry, but an anti-establishment one culturally, but then when it became like a thing that, you know, was be becoming celebrated overseas, the government pivoted and sort of appropriated that to soft power agenda right. of the state. But it wasn't state initiated. It was, right. the state was reactive to things that yes. young people and famous yeah. people were doing. And in that context, I think the discourse of state resistance doesn't quite work for me. Like, I think we can mm -hmm. use a different vocabulary to describe yeah. that dynamic yeah. because it's not like the young people were doing something in complicity or in resistance yeah. to the state. I mean, that's not the cultural frame that they were operating in. They yeah. were doing things for their communities and you know, they were countercultural and doing creative work and cultural innovation, but I don't think they would have describe what they're doing as somehow either for or against or aligned with government. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you. This is so great. And, and we should talk more later too. Um, just real quick uh, before Paul makes a transition to the outside. <laughs> um, so, so I've been ex exactly sort of struggling with or grappling with it. So I think state resistance doesn't account for what they want to do. We are the, the, the sort of how people how they talk about it has also shifted over these. So I had this meme with the three cats, right? And so when I first arrived in China 2021, China was in such a moment of we China's on top of the world. It managed COVID really well, millions of deaths in America and Europe. And and you know, China seemed like it's it's coming out of the pandemic really well. And that completely flipped just six months later. And these these terms of like nature and and um, tongue ping and sort of and sort of the protests that also um, the white people protests that occurred at the end of the zero COVID management before the government opened up and got rid of all the COVID measures um, showed so much anger and frustration that cut across class, that cut across generations. So there is now more of this anti-state kind of sentiment that is very pronounced in these young people. And they don't use political language, though, because they are very clever about navigating around the censorship. Mm -hmm. So it's not positioned as anti-state. And yet many of them, when you, when I talked with them, were really, really angry. Like if there was such a strong pronounced and you know visceral sort of emotion about against Xi Jinping in particular. And so but then at the same time, what I was trying to show with the rule revitalization policy is that the government is really clever in creating these ways of um, inviting loosely defined policies that invite participation and where it's pe the young people wouldn't that who I met didn't position themselves as implementing these projects, right? That's not what they had in mind. And yet in part, that's what they did. And so, so I've been sort of, I'm trying to think about this puzzle of like, how can I theorize a group of young people who is on the uh, who is saying we push against the state and yet feeding the state like so that's what i'm playing with with the data engines but it might not be the perfect term but thank you so sylvia will be outside there's more opportunity for um for having her with questions um but first i want to promise that we'll invite you back before 2036. <laughs> so thank you again. after another book <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So come and join us outside.